Good morning, everybody here. Good morning, everyone on live stream. Uh, my name is Alex Taylor, and I am a licensed spiritual practitioner here. So let's take a moment to go within and close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. And let's recall the words of the song that RL just sang. How beautiful to hear those words about gratefulness, gratitude, and God. And as I welcome us here this morning, I give thanks for each person in this room, for knowing that we are surrounded by spirit inside and out, and that this morning we delight in the words and in the music and in the sharing of one another being here. And I give thanks for Reverend John and his music, and RL and Alyssa, and the live streamers, and Mac, who is teaching our children about our philosophy. There is so much to be grateful for, and so many possibilities and opportunities within this next 24 hours. And we are all blessed to be here, and so it is. And I read Reverend John's blog about creativity, and of course I was one that said, well, yeah, I'm not creative. No, I'm not, I'm not. Look at these two, you know? <laughs> I mean, come on. I, I, I. Yeah, you see us trying to do <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at paperwork. I love bookkeeping. I am creative with bookkeeping. No. Um, so I was thinking about that, and it was like, yeah. And then I was sitting around my living room, and I thought, well, yeah, I created this living room. A lot. Well, Ron helped with the living room. Um, and I created the snow paths outside and, and soup. I mean, it just, we're all creating constantly. And that's what Ernest, Ernest Holmes says. Uh, I'm not going to get this right, but every thought is a crea creative itself. So we are all very creative. And I'm sure we've all created a lot of things already this morning. So I am going to read from Marianne Williamson's Illuminata and its thoughts, prayers, uh, for rites of passage. And she has a chapter, it's called Prayers for Work and Creativity. Um, and when I saw work, it's like she's talking about our work in the world. So she says, the love within us is meant to extend outward. The closer we grow to our inner light, the more we feel the natural urge to share that light with others. So it is that we all long for meaningful work some creative endeavor that will be our ministry by which the energies within us might flow out to heal the world. Our activity in the world is our work. Our primary work, as we have already established, is to love and forgive. Our secondary work is our worldly employment. The meaning of work, whatever its form, is that it be used to heal the world. The essence of a business is the vision behind it. An illumined vision is service to all of humanity. Love is the most powerful fuel in any, in any endeavor. The most important question to ask about work is, how does this serve the world? To whatever extent it contributes healing of some form to society, to that extent the project is blessed. Blessing means mystical support and protection. If you want your business to succeed, pray that it only serve mankind. Prayer makes that happen. Prayer is our way of signing up with the army of light and receiving its reinforcements on a regular basis. The light is a realm of consciousness rising up in all around us, altering the dominant mental paradigm of our age. Its function is to replace the energies of selfishness with compassion, and competition with service, that we might cast out fear through the power of love. And she has several prayers that she writes about creativity and work, and I'm going to read one. Dear God, I desire to help create a new context for human work and wealth in which all people might prosper, in which all pro poverty might disappear, in which all of us might achieve as you would have us achieve, and give to others as you would have us give. 
Let the illusions that hold us back, dear God, as individuals and as society, as a society now disappear. Let me have new energy. Let me have a new sense of purpose. Let me know that I am on this earth to serve. Let me not feel guilty about the expression of my power. Let me no longer play small, regardless of others' react, people's reactions when I play big. I am willing to receive an expanded set of options that you, dear God, might work miracles in my life. You might cast out all negative and limited conditions of this world. May I receive a future unlike the past for myself and for others. For I now open my mind to possibilities I have not dreamed of, to forces of life I have not allowed in, and to realms of joy that I have hardly imagined. I let go. I release everything that blocks me in this endeavor from my past, from my pre present, and from my future. May I awaken from the dream of my inadequate self. Amen. And we're going to do, because January's affirmation was so great, we're going to do it today again. <laughs> uh, it's uh, on your insert in red. I release what no longer serves me in order to make room for something else amazing. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Um, a thought of the day. Uh, so um, Friday night, I um, had a new experience. For the first time in my 22 and a half years of living in the Wood River Valley, I went to the casino. <laughs> Um, we were we were celebrating the fact that Alyssa and I had been playing cabaret for the spot, and uh, today's the closing performances. But we were with some of the cast and uh, and uh, creatives. We were celebrating uh, that process, and I found myself at the casino, and I didn't get home until after 1 a.m. <laughs> and I had to have a little talk with myself and say, "Who do you think you are?" Um, but it was delightful. And then Saturday morning, I found myself at the high school early nine o'clock-ish, uh, working with a student uh, who has written a song. Um, and it's a lovely song, and it matters deeply to her. She's very nervous about it and very um, excited to work on it, at the same time a little afraid to allow somebody else into her creative process, because so far it was her idea to write a song she started thinking about what she wanted to say and she wrote the lyrics and she found a melody and she had a very 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 rudimentary um, accompaniment that she could play on the piano so she could play it for herself and the accompaniment went something like this exactly what she needed to get the bones of the song put together and I said to her what if the what if the accompaniment went and it took her breath away a little bit and I said that's not mine that's yours that's just what I heard from what you've done um, and I and we talked a lot about creativity and about uh, the desire to express. And I have to say, this beautiful, wonderful young woman is not on the easiest part of her journey right now. Currently, she's on one of those, uh, those little rugged parts of her path, uh, working hard to sort of keep all the wheels on the road. Um, but f for that time on Saturday morning, it's creativity that was the anchor. Um, and not only for her, but for me. RL rarely pay, plays what's on the page. Well, I don't no, know if you we realize use that. It as a reference. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you do melodies and you know and sometimes it's got time. like my notes from last week up there as a prop. So, um, <laughs> so and of course we're blessed with RL almost every week. And Alyssa, like I said, we're going to um, let the air out of your tires and you're not leaving. <laughs> I think it's not Thank you for those who brave the slick roads. Thank you at home who are in your spa robes. Um, I, I envy you a little bit. Even my dog didn't want to leave. You know, he loves everybody. And he was like, no. 
You know, we had to like literally pull him down the stairs this morning. I'm like, no, no, it's really not up. But anyways, it's all perfect. I'm so glad that we're able to have you at home be here with us, even though you're physically not here. So yes, fr um, the February is about creativity. And I want to start today how I started my blog. For those who may not have read it, so I just, if you could close your eyes for a moment. And inwardly, with me, I want us to repeat inwardly, I am creative. Just do it inwardly with me. I am creative. I am creative. I am creative. And come back. Were they not getting yeah, I'm, I'm working. We're having a little technical issue here. We'll let them handle it. <laughs> so until they, they feel that they have it handled, I'll talk through here. How's that sound? So let's go back into that little energy for a second. I am creative. Notice, first of all, emotionally what you feel when you say, I am creative. Let's say it again, I am creative. Notice if you had any physical reactions to that. And come back. So the physical reactions could have been something like, well, it could have been a positive thing because, yeah, I'm creative. <laughs> you know, that, that feeling of like, woof, you know. Or it could have been like a little bit of a, like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Um, and, and emotionally, again, something very similar. You could have felt like, yeah, I, Alex just did her living room. I'm creative. Or I made soup or something. Um, or you may have just emotionally had that, like, I'm, you know, I'm not really convinced. And even as Alex mentioned, you see RL and you see Alyssa and you think, well, I don't do that. <laughs> but then, of course, Alyssa was able to confess that she's terrible in an office. Are we good? <laughs> so I think I can step down now. We're good? Okay. Or if you go to one of our many um, galleries, especially if you did a gallery night, I've not done that for a long time, and even if you do a little drawing or doodling at home, I think we all do a little bit, uh, if you go to one of the galleries, you might look at that and go, that is amazing, and I could never do that. Don't we also kind of do that? So we think, well, yeah, I, creativity is in degrees, and we may put ourselves down a few rungs. But the truth is, we are all immensely creative. As it is said in our new thought philosophy, thought itself is creative. And in fact, through your thought and beliefs, you have called forth your life as it is right now. And I don't mean this to, I mean, sometimes we think that's a good news, bad news. But you called it forth. And if we don't like what we have called forth, we can call something different forth. And it doesn't mean that we can have necessarily the white picket fence life. But it does mean that the substance of our life can be much richer than it is if we don't feel that it's rich. So how does this work? So first of all, during this morning, I want you to start being okay with the fact that you are creative. I mean, again, just look at your life however it is right now. You brought that forth. And I think mostly that's really a good thing. But let's look at this. this let's get right back down to uh, new thought. And what does it mean to say that thought is creative? really primed on this, as some of you are in the room. We're having a class right now, so I might call on some people. No, if they're like, <laughs> no, no, no. You know, you just like to kind of get the people's blood to wash out of their face. Um, but anyways, we, I'm teaching or facilitating 
what a class that is called Roots of Science of Mind. Basically, this class is the most academic of the classes that, that we offer, uh, meaning it's, it's very book oriented and or sometimes real left brainy sort of things, where the other ones are more expansive. And I don't think all our students realize <laughs> how brainy it was going to be. But it studies three of the authors that had the most influence on Ernest Holmes and his writings. And they're really rich and full of amazing things. And these are 19th century writers who speak from their own cultures. I, I'm, I, I'm finding it amazing that there are some pages that have no punctuation. <laughs> I kill for semicolons. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's like, when are you going uh, to talk about stream of consciousness? It's like, OK. Where, where we're going to stop, because you know sometimes you want to highlight, where do I stop this? Do I just highlight the whole chapter? When are you going to stop? Stop already, please, stop. And, and so, but if you kind of go with it and realize, okay, it's a whole different world, and even some odd cultural things that get thrown in that are like, really, you believe that? But there are some great seed ideas that I think once we get to the discussion, we're enjoying the class, but it's the reading is like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the last two weeks, we've been reading works of Thomas Troward. And he really had a great deal to do about this idea that thought is creative and how that works. And it was amazing to, for me personally to be reacquainted with the source material. And since I'm kind of used to it, I can kind of, I've got my secret decoder ring and I can probably go through it a little bit faster than, than some of you that haven't read it before. But this is how we create. And it's kind of opposite of, I think, how as humans we, we think it works. But it works in a different way. Well, first of all, as to bring it updated, um, Deepak Chopra will say that Everything that we see before us and don't see is a field of infinite possibilities. It is energized with the creative force of spirit and the divine. And that the way that we create is to partner with it. It says basically, you can create whatever you want. You just have to be clear on what it is you want to create. And where we find confusion in our lives sometime, I believe, is when we are less clear. So the whole point is to get clear on what it is we would like to experience. But as humans, we get it backwards a little bit. We think that it, it starts with small steps to big steps. Doesn't that what we say? Like, it's like, take baby steps kind of thing. So let, let's think of any major thing that you've done in your life that you took on. A new career, you're going to start college, or a huge training program, or I'm moving from the East Coast to here, or you know something big. I mean, you know, like your life is just going to be shook up in a major way. Don't we usually start with the small steps? Okay, well, I guess I'll have to buy packing boxes at some point. Um, gee, um, how will I get there? You know what I mean? It's just or w when I started college, like, you know, how many classes do I need to take? How will I get the tuition? You know what I mean? The, so we start with those sort of things. And when you stay stuck in kind of the weeds there a little bit, you can almost get so overwhelmed that you might almost not start. Isn't that? It? It's like, if you do a to-do list, like, okay, let's move to Paris. Okay, learn French. That's a small one. You know what I mean? It's just you can like get you can get stopped in your tracks before you get going because just like that's just too much. But the way that it works in New Thought and in Troward's writing is that you start with the big thing first, the big step, and even what you would think of the final step. And rather than look at the details of how you might think to envision your new life and whatever it is that you start with the big idea of what you are calling forth in your life without the details. Just much like um, Alex had said from her reading of starting a new business and being really clear that it serves humankind in some way. So in other words, she wasn't writing a Marianne Williamson about the business plan. The business plan was serving her humankind. That's a great way to start with any of our big plans. But to get, so what are the big, actual large 
vision, visualization of what you hope to do in the world by your life or this new thing that you're bringing into your life. And you start with the big thing. That's why so many places you go to, including us, will be a mission and vision statement. As you read ours, it doesn't tell you what times our doors get unlocked every day. It doesn't tell you what time I show up. You know what I mean? It doesn't say anything about classes or whatever. You get that information eventually. But it says, boom, this is what we stand for. And so what I have found during the years that as we have had our little rocky points, as we all do, you know, we had recessions, you know, diseases, COVID and all that, things that, that are like make it rocky, you always go back to what's the big thing that we're here to do? And, and in your own life as well, if you're having things that are just confusing or just not going well, to go back to the big thing. What is my life about? What is it that I want to call forth more than anything, regardless of what career I have, regardless of what city I live in, regardless of how I spend my Sunday mornings? What is the larger idea of my life? And what I have found that usually the small steps change, the large steps often don't. We might expand it a bit, but the core of who we are and why we came here and what we hope to do as a spiritual human being, I think is somewhat constant. But some of the challenges in there, just like when we say I am creative and maybe cringe a little bit, just to say that I have a larger idea for my life, that makes us shrink a little bit as well. Like, who am I to have a larger idea for my life? I just need to, like, well, pay my rent or mortgage and get some food on the table or, you know, and we all do those things. But regardless of how it shows up in the physical, there is a larger idea for our life. And it can be very simple and subtle Sometimes in, in our egotism, we think that if I'm not finding the cure for cancer, that somehow it's not a big thing. It's always a big thing, regardless of how it is that you are expressing it, whether you have a paid job or not a paid job. Um, that is completely separate from having a larger purpose in your mind. And just like that reading, it could be as simple as saying that in some way, shape, or form, I will always be in service to humankind. The checkout line at the Haley Post Office. <laughs> oh, I don't, don't get me going. But you know what I mean. I'm here to serve humankind, regardless of what I do, and I'm going to be amused and interested to see how that shows up today. It could be something as simple as that. And when you are having your frustrating moments, because we all are frustrated, we all have times that we just feel beat up by life, to go back to that thing, and in that case, to say, yeah, I feel really beat up today, and how can I be in service? You always bring it back to the big thing. And that's how this works in new thought. And as, so this is crypt notes for everyone in my class. It's the big thing to be concerned about. What is the big thing that you want to have, in a sense, manifest into your experience? And again, it's usually not about new carpeting and chairs and things. It's the big thing. And the little things have a way of attracting to it that, not that you don't need to give them concern, but they're far less of a concern when you're really clear on the larger thing. And we've all had amazing spirit experiences like that. And I think sometimes by accident that we were just so overtaken by a, a larger idea that maybe it was our life or we were participating in. It was like, I couldn't believe how things just kept showing up. And I couldn't believe how the things that I hoped to go away actually went away. And again, that's all the big thing consciousness that we may have accidentally fallen into. So the whole point of Troward, again, take notes, students, it's the big thing. And when we talk about you know, the creative force of, of the universe, it is putting that big idea into that and letting it do its work to do co-creation in your life. And that's when it's almost kind of fun where you think, it is just amazing how this thing is showing up. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean 
that you won't have setbacks. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be in a bad mood some days. It's not going to mean that someone's just going to be in your face like this in some days. Just go back to the big thing. But we get weighed down by the little things. And you might be like, like on a kite in consciousness, and sometimes that one thing can like, boof, bring it down. I saw a two-minute video this, this, this week that I just thought was great in, in how it demonstrates this. And we all have stories similar to this. This guy, 30-ish, and I, he didn't really talk about much of his life now, but I got the feeling that he was successful in a way that he wanted to be successful, and that his life, his successful life, gave him a certain amount of monetary success. He didn't really brag about what he had, but he said, the success in his life meant that he had to unlearn one thing that was told to him in grade school. There is nothing more powerful than the words of teachers. And I think it was like second, third grade, something like that. And as some of you know, it can be kind of fun um, to ask an open-ended question to eight or nine-year-olds. Because you never know where they're going to go with it. Uh, yeah, I, teachers I know, oh yeah, that's kind of fun. So the open-ended question that this teacher asked her class was, what kind of house do you have? And can you just imagine how sometimes an eight or nine-year-old might answer that and just go any number of places, um, talk about the cat box in the shower or something. It just Who knows where they're going to go? It's almost dangerous to ask those questions. But anyways, um, teacher came to him and he says, we have a big house. And he said, she's just kind of got this stern look on her face. says, I live in a big house. People like you don't live in big houses. Ah, I know. Didn't that just, you know, just kind of kick you right here? And he said it took a great deal of his life to unlearn that. Because it's interesting, not only all of us, but kids sometimes, it's amazing how much can kind of like just slide off our backs that we almost forget that we even heard something. But occasionally something lands. And especially young kids, they'll hear a lot of things that they'll never remember, but something will land like that. And as he's told in, the, um, in that little video, that it became part of him for a period of time. And of course, for it, he also believed that he was not deserving of that for a long time. And his inner growth was, it wasn't about the house. It was about that he was deserving. And he said, you know, I've got a nice house. I unlearned it. So we, we take these, what we know to be the truth, but we get hooked into those things that can bring us to a place that we don't want to go. And, and it can be seemingly like this, this almost battle within us. You know, in first grade, I had a similar experience with him. A teacher, don't need the story, told me I really was not enough in some way. Then, in, as a junior in high school, during a time I was having really a great difficulty in my family and so many just tragic things were going on, and I sought out my favorite teacher, and her, she just said basically, you can do this. You are enough. There is nothing wrong with you. And what was interesting, and I look back now, I had both those voices in my head. The first grade teacher and the high school teacher. And I can really see as I was starting to make life for myself away from the home I grew up in, those two voices were there, and the question was which one was going to win out? And I like to think the high school one won out. But you know, those other ones, they're, they're so insidious, don't they? they you, just, you think you've gotten rid of them. They're, you, know, you think, oh, yeah, I you know, put that behind me. And then just in a weak moment, it just kind of zings you over there a little bit. And so you have to do that inner work again. Get back to the bigger thing. Who am I here? What am I here to do? Why am I here? And that larger idea, and we all have had someone affirm who we are in a positive way as well. We also, unfortunately, have those who have affirmed us in a negative way. But go back to the one that's telling the truth. On that same line, I read a great story this morning. Um, as I was just kind of popping through, through the news. 
there was this, this young girl, nine, and this is contemporary, I guess happened recently. Um, she seems to be like a budding biologist. And she had read that the United States Agriculture Department had sent out this advisory that there's a certain like moth, and I can't remember the name of it, that's considered an invasive species in the state that she lives. And they're telling everyone, we need to get rid of these moths. And so she was creating these science experiments of like natural things at home of what can I put on the moths, I know, to kill them. And she, you know, how you've seen these people who, what do you call people who collect insects? I don't know. It's a big word I can't say. And putting them up on little boards and things like that, I'm like, really, what nine-year-olds do this sort of thing? I mean, it's just like, you know, really getting into this. And so she was in her neighborhood doing her experiments, and someone called the police on her. This nine-year girl happened to be black, and the, the complaint was, there is a black girl up to no good in our neighborhood. And it was very traumatic for her, obviously, to be stopped by the police on her own street and to be questioned in this way. But one thing led to another, and her experiments got noticed by Yale University. She was invited to have a day dedicated to her to acknowledge her work and to present her work. And she brought her little things with the pin, all that in there. And I, and I, I just love this from her mom. It was, was quoted as saying, she said, this did not happen to us, this happened for us. So again, it may not always turn out that you get invited to Yale. But whenever we're in this choice of who are we going to believe, there, we can eventually get to a sense that regardless of what's happening, it is done, being done for me in some way. In the present moment, it may not make any sense. But all of us, look in, again, look in the rearview mirror. I think we can all see how some of these even traumatic things were done for us on some level. Even things that, believe me, we don't want to repeat again. I got a whole list, don't you? Don't want to do that again. But I can see how now it was for me on some level, and it brought us, me to here. So the whole point in this, accept the truth within the larger thing. And in a lot of reading I was doing this week, to really be dedicated to leave what have attached to us from the past and the negative behind. I think in class I shared a quote from Ernest Holmes this, this week that I love it because it's so graphic and kind of icky. You know how we like spiritual quotes to be, ah. <laughs> this is not one of those. He says, leave the corpse of yesterday behind and don't bring it into your present moment. And I just love, you know, like, ooh, icky, smelly, ooh, ooh. Like, why do you want to bring that stuff? I mean, imagine if you went to the store and got like a bag of chicken and carried it with you for two years. No one would want to be with you. You're like, well, don't you want to go to the movies? No, <laughs> leave the chicken at home, we'll talk about it. <laughs> but that's how some of these old ideas are. It's like, your friends are tired of them. Aren't you tired of them yet? So it's back to the big idea of who you are and why you're here. And in those low moments, go back to the big thing. And I know we all have those moments. And we all just, just have days that we can't seemingly get away from them. But you can crawl your way back up to the big thing. Just want to close today with um, a quote from a book I've been reading, The Book of Knowing and Worth. And it says, every opportunity is an opportunity for you to know yourself in a new way. In the face of pain, you may know yourself in strength. In the face of loss, you may know yourself as gifted. In the face of death, you may know yourself as alive. We can always choose. So let's just close our eyes again. And let's end where we began. I am creative. I am creative. I am creative. I open the door to unlimited possibility. 
I am in the right place at the right time doing exactly what I need to be doing in any given moment. Even if it doesn't look like it, it is. I allow myself to know the larger essence of my existence in life. I affirm the larger idea of who I am. And I allow that to be who I show up as in everything that I do. So, we give thanks together. We give thanks for this crazy world where things sometimes look upside down. It's here for us. And in this, we just let it go. We release it into that creative medium, that infinite place of possibility, and let it do its work. And so it is. Mm -hmm.